Welcome to Sounds Like Portraits. I'm Philippe Ungar. This podcast is all about creativity. In this episode, you'll hear gallerist Eric Mourlot, who comes from a great family of printers in Paris. They used to work with Picasso, Calder, Chagall, Miro, and Dubuffet, to name just a few. Eric became a gallerist to participate in his artist's creative process and to make it available to other people. So I asked him, is it better to know the artist to better know his or her work? Listen to his answer. But before, he told me what he tried to do all his life. All my life, I've always tried to help artists uh, in their quest. I think that I'm an amplifier in a way. That's my job. That's my role, I believe, um, on Earth. And that's what our role as gallerists and people involved in publishing or printing, we're there to actually amplify the audience so that the artist has the time to go and create. How would you describe your life without art? Art, as a form of expression, is indispensable. You, you cannot live without art. You can appreciate art at all sorts of levels. If you have an education, it can be helpful Although it can sometimes be detrimental because you can actually shut yourself off from um, several works of art, I think, or styles. In the past, I've actually been guilty of that myself, where I was maybe denigrating a certain art form without really knowing that much about it or because I was basing myself on a more traditional education. You come from a great family of printers in Paris. How did it all start in 1852, if I remember well? That's correct. 1852 was my great-great-grandfather. Uh, I'm the fifth generation. And he had a small business printing wallpaper. And eventually that grew into a larger commercial business with my great-grandfather. And it's only my grandfather who, in the 1920s, was uh, approached and approached some of his friends that were working for the National Museums and uh, they were complaining that they were not getting enough traffic through the museums. And, and he suggested that maybe they would take the approach that theaters and cabarets had taken in the mid to late 19th century when they asked Chéret and Toulouse-Lautrec and Mucha to make posters so that people could actually visually see on the streets of Paris what something that would actually inspire them to go to the theater or to the cabaret. And he said, why don't we do that with um, museum shows? And that's where it started. It's really in 1923 that we really started printing artistic posters for the National Museums, which was then later followed by publications such as Verve, uh, which was done by Terriade, which were really nice um, magazine for art collectors or art connoisseurs, and then also limited edition lithographs, and also galleries uh, started advertising their exhibitions, just like the museums, through posters that were placed on the streets of Paris, on the walls and windows of cafes. How did you learn the printing techniques? Well, I think that after school, we very, very Parisian in a way, um, even though I was born in New York, I moved back to Paris when I was two years old with my parents, and um, my school was on the Rue de l'Ambre. Then my uh, middle school was on Boulevard du Montparnasse. And after that, uh, the lycée, I went to uh, Stanislas. So this was all within three, four blocks. And after school, I would go over to the print shop to do my homework and to make a little extra money. My, uh, my father would make me clean the printing rollers, the, the press rollers uh, with the ink. He would make me clean the latrines after 100 employees <laughs> had, had actually used it all day long. And I got used to the smell of the studio, of the ink, of um, the sound of the presses. And I always found it so fascinating. And to this day, I just feel so at home there. And I think little by little, I just learned most of the positions that you have in the print shop. So whether it's uh, receveur, margeur, or, or you're pulling um, trial proofs, 
all this I can pretty much do. I, I understand actually what the work of a comiste is, but I never really had the ten, fifteen years to put into it. So, are there memories with artists that come to mind right now? The first ones, it's mostly pictures that remind me of maybe situations. There's a picture with Calder, but I was very young. I don't, I can't say I really remember exactly. I must have been five years old. Uh, I do remember Miro actually giving me a, a box of paint, but I remember probably Miro and Chagall the best. Uh, Bernard Buffet working at the studio. Uh, also delivering sometimes the editions to their homes in Chagall, we would uh, basically deliver the edition in the south of France at uh, Saint Paul de Vence, where he would actually sign them at his house. So the, yeah, wonderful memories, of, especially the the time that uh, Miro gave me a box of paint, and uh, that's when I think I discovered that I had absolutely no talent. I repainted my grandmother's kitchen, and that didn't go over very well. She was quite upset. Why is the printing process a creative process for you? Very often people think that printing is just a reproduction. And it can be, but lithography in itself actually is a, is a very complicated process because even if it's done by a craftsman, it's all handmade. It's not to be mistaken with what they call photolitho, which is kind of a the wrong word for it. True lithography is really about the artist working directly on the stone, or even a craftsman reproducing by hand a painting on the stone. But really, original lithography is when the artist will go and use a lithographic ink, which is a greasy ink, which is then uh, applied on a limestone, and only the areas that will be drawn uh, with that greasy ink will later retain the printing ink, so the different colored ink. And it's because it's absorbed by the uh, limestone. And then we prepare it chemically so that we can reuse it and, and actually print, of course, two, three, four hundred. We could probably print more in the editions, but actually we, we were trying to keep the editions somewhat limited. What were the most challenging aspects of collaborating with artists for, for the printing process? Well, I think it really depends on the personality of the artist and the printer. And sometimes it could be contentious and help. You know, for example, uh, you can look at uh, Le Père Tutin, who was this old master printer, was uh, working uh, most of the time with Picasso. And he absolutely hated Picasso's artwork because he was very traditionalist. And Picasso would actually egg him on quite often because Picasso was using all sorts of materials that you're never supposed to use, such as wax or gasoline. And quite often, it was very, very difficult to pull out trial proofs from, from these works. And uh, when uh, Tutin would receive the, the, the plates or the stones, he, uh, he would immediately just start ooing and eyeing and, 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 and complaining. And Picasso would turn to him and say, um, Oh, here I thought you were the best printer in Paris. You know, you were the master printer, but I guess I was wrong. And automatically that was a challenge for Tutin, and he would start actually working on the stone and, and quite often would be able to at least pull four, five, or six trial proofs. Now, sometimes it really couldn't be continuous in the sense that the wax would start coming off, and then we couldn't actually pull a whole edition. But it was through experimentation that Picasso was getting to, to this. And then you have, you know, personalities. I think that uh, some artists are easier to work with than, than others. Sometimes they get along with a master printer, and they can do amazing, tremendous things. Uh, Chagall had a very close relationship with Charles Sorolier, for example, and Jojo Sagourin, uh, who was his uh, master printer. Picasso, of course, was close to Henri Deschamps, his chromiste. But then you, um, you had some artists that preferred to um, you know, work by themselves. They didn't necessarily enjoy being in the studio. Uh, so, for example, Jean Dubuffet basically thought that it was more efficient to simply rent a press and one of the workmen and bring them to his studio so he could actually really work on the process of lithography nonstop without having to come to the Morlo studio, but we still, you know, would be in touch with him and he would be calling my grandfather for tips and ideas. So, so those are the different challenges depending on the personalities.
any personal memories of your collaboration with uh, artists in the printing process? Well, I started probably doing my own projects pretty early on uh, with my first gallery. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's funny because I, I became a gallerist uh, because I moved to, to New York. I really feel that I'm more of a printer and publisher, and I've always wanted to go back to that. However, to restart uh, a print shop and to open up a print shop in New York would have been prohibitive. So I kind of became a gallerist reluctantly. But really what I love is to do my own projects. So I worked with a lot of uh, young contemporary artists as of uh, 1992, 1993, other for first projects that I did. I brought three American artists to Paris um, where they created a series of lithographs. And we did probably all together with these three artists uh, about 15 or 16 editions. For the first time, and I was, I was 22 years old, 23 years old, and that was the most exciting project that I had ever done by them. It wasn't so much that the artists were famous, it was just that finally I was getting to do what I really truly wanted, which was to create, uh, or, or to participate, I should say, because the artists were creating, but to participate in the creation of artistic editions, which would then be able to be enjoyed by um, hundreds of people. And that was the most exciting time for me. Is this exhibiting process a creative process for you as a gallerist? I don't think it's... It's creative in the sense that, you know, we, we have to put the show together. We have to curate it. But I think it's important that we don't start thinking of ourselves as artists. Just as the printers are quite proud of be, to be artisans. And as a gallerist, I think that I'm here to make this creative process available to other people. I'm here to explain for the artists why this is important, why the work is the way it is. It's more than a job. It's really a passion. You, I, I could not imagine doing something else. As a matter of fact, I tried for several years working uh, in banks. You know, I, I certainly am not knocking it. It just was not for me. I really love what I do, and I think that sometimes I, I, I probably invest too much in certain projects even if they don't end up being financially successful. I think they're important to do, and I think it's important to help certain artists achieve what they want to achieve. Is there something you can't really learn to be a good gallerist? I think that to be a good gallerist, truly you have to walk a tight rope between business, surviving, being successful, being able to give Um, artists a living, giving them the space and the time to create, but also being able to let their creative juices work and allowing them uh, to do projects that maybe would not be as financially successful, but are just nonetheless very important. What kind of experience do you want to offer to someone who enter your gallery as a collector? You know, as a collector or just simply as someone who came to view the work, because sometimes I have had some of my most interesting conversations with people that couldn't afford to purchase something, but they just wanted to see the work. And what I want to do is I want them to give them the time and the space to observe the work and to be available if they have any questions. Uh, we get a lot of tours, especially on the weekends, where 30, 40 people will come in with someone leading a tour. And usually I try to sort of stand in the back and, and let the tour guide talk about the work, or if the artist is there, I let the artist listen and, and talk to them. But I stand back, and if they need me, I want to be able to give them my take on it or explain certain things so that maybe they will notice something that they had not before. Is it better to know the artist to better know or to better appreciate his or her work? So this is really interesting, and I'm skewed on that, of course, because I really enjoy knowing the artist. I mean, I think it, it's, it's different for everyone. I think some people would rather not know the artist because maybe it might detract from the work. In my case, I've always found that it was something that was more exciting to actually know the artist, to feel like I was closer to the source of creativity. 
And in some cases, it might actually affect the way you look at the work. It, it, it might um, it might make you feel that uh, if you like the personality of the artist, it might make you feel like maybe the work is more interesting or or you're you're willing to forgive them more. But also, if the artist is just uh, unfriendly, uh, maybe you're going to start looking at the artwork and not feel that it's really as impressive or, or as important as, as you thought it was. So it definitely affects the relationship that you can have on the work. Is it a good thing? Uh, well, that's actually a really great point. And that's something that, you know, I actually had several artists with whom I'm really friendly, uh, even one that I actually grew up with. And to this day, I've never had an exhibition of, of hers at the gallery because I just do not believe that the work is at the level that I need to show the viewers. And and sometimes, you know, it's 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 not it's not really democratic. I mean, of course, you know, I run a gallery, so it's my choice and and I decide what is going to be on the walls. And sometimes I have been somewhat affected because I really like someone and I, I may not compromise, but I, I may if if I feel that the work deserves to be given a chance, then I might give a show. But if it turns out that the work is inconsistent and does not follow through a few years later, there won't be a second show. So yes, um, you have to make sure that you have your integrity and you don't start showing just anything that's out there or, or, or just make it too commercial. Can you judge quality in art in a separate way from your own taste? Yes, um, that's another thing. Um, if you were to ask me, for example, who in my mind are some of the most important artists of you know the past 120 years or so i would definitely say cezanne whom i adore i would definitely say uh, picasso whom i really adore and i would say jackson pollock whom i don't particularly adore but i also understand how important his work is it's not something that i would want to live with in my house uh, so yes you can absolutely make the difference you have to be open-minded and you have to understand. I mean, I, I understand like, for many years I, I was having problems with pop art, but I really have opened up my mind on that and I understand how important pop art is. It might not always be the, the, you know, the, the type of artwork that I prefer or that I would put on my walls, but I absolutely understand. How would you define an eye for art? Uh, well, I think that's, uh, I think it's something that, anything else you you develop probably i think that um you you have first an instinct a feeling and that's what i try to look in people that come in the gallery for the first time or people that maybe are willing to say that they don't know that much about art i say okay well how do you feel about it first but then as you get more and more educated about it you can really define things it's it's like picking up code if, you, if you're reading a poem uh or particular poet, once you have their code, you can start decoding some of their poetry and it suddenly starts making sense. Or even if you were to use opera, for example, uh, if you go to the opera the first time, it might be a little bit difficult for you to really enjoy this and you might think, oh wow, I have to sit here for four hours. But as you develop a taste for it, you start picking up several things and, 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 and that really builds your taste. So your eye becomes more and more trained. But at first you have to look at things, I think, like a child. You have to just let your first instinct, your first feelings sort of guide you. And then as you learn more or you read more about the artist or about different types of artwork, it really helps you go deeper into uh, a painting or an image. Uh, and so it, it trains your eyes. Looking at art like a child, that's exactly what artists do. Well, I think that uh, some artists definitely, uh, Miro, Picasso, these, these guys really wanted to sort of deconstruct what they had all learned uh, that was more traditional before. But you have other artists that... Um, wanted to be more intellectual. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at Kandinsky, if you're looking at some of these artists, they, they didn't want to look at things like a child. They wanted to go even further into um, intellectualism, and they were 
looking at math. They were looking at um, a lot of different influences, while Picasso was looking at other things that were more childlike. And I think that that's what he wanted to sort of get down to. So it, it depends. And Picasso said it takes a life to see like a child again. That's right, to see and to paint like a child. It, it, you know, he, he, he said it took me a lifetime exactly to, to get to this point. And if you look at the earlier work, I mean, it's, it's very traditional. It's very influenced by the academy and its father. And little by little, um, even Cubism, which is a wonderful, I mean, Cubism is just André Breton and Max Jacob and all these people, um, so important, so strong. And then at the end, he just basically draws like a child, several clowns if you look at it. But it took really a lifetime. I mean, I, we, we posted an image on our Facebook um, the other day, and you would not believe the arguments between people that we don't know, that go on our uh, page, and people are really, really angry that this is a piece of artwork, and other people are equally angry that someone doesn't see the importance of that. So it's just really all in the eye of the beholder. Precisely. Is looking at an art collection a good way to know the collector, to know the, the viewer? So there's a caveat to that. I think that unfortunately nowadays a lot of collectors um, have consultants. Uh, I think that a lot of collectors are buying because they're trying to project a certain, um, how can I explain? Image of image themselves. Of, exactly, image of themselves and also the speculation. But if you were to really look at a, a true art collection that is not built by somebody else, that is um, really um, a collection that was built by a collector or a couple, for example, yes, you would absolutely get a reflection of their personality. Uh, you would understand and you would see a lot about that collector. Did you learn anything essential for you from the artists you knew or you still no. Absolutely. Um, I think that what I learned is work ethic. The artist that I knew, and I, I would say, you know, a majority of artists are not what people think. They're not lazy. They are hardworking. And they work sometimes, I think they are sometimes maniacs. I mean, they can work at three in the morning, or they have a very strong regimen where they wake up at five in the morning and they work until two o'clock and then they do something else. But they're, they're, you have to be very hardworking to be an artist, I believe, and certainly an important or successful artist. And beyond that, I think it's just also how to look at the world from lots of different perspectives. And there's no two artists that are exactly alike. And it's amazing, I, I can, you can recognize, it, even though it's just simply a circle or a star or a shape, you can recognize Miro from 100 feet away. You can recognize Picasso. You can see the style, uh, even, if, even if they are working on different um, types of, 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 of work, whether it's a sculpture, whether it's a pottery, whatever, you can actually see something that was created by Picasso and you can recognize that it is Picasso or Miro or Chagall or Matisse. And that's amazing. It's just because of their personality translates directly into the artwork. You know, you look at someone like Matisse who, who worked incredibly diff. I mean, it was very hard for him to, to get to these lines. They're so elegant, so beautiful, and so reminiscent of Angle, for example. Just making the line so pure and elegant. That's very different than, you know, a Picasso who basically just paints with his guts and, and, and the truth and who will just keep on reworking or, 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 or do the perfect line from the start, but will never sort of go back and try a new line. I'm going to leave the room. Please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview. Well, when I'm alone with my thoughts, um, I have to say that quite often I think about art everywhere. Everywhere I am, when I'm in the subway, when I'm at home in the kitchen, uh, or when I'm in bed, I'm always thinking about 
art and the artist. And I'm always thinking, how can I do my job as, um, as an amplificator um, better? How can I really devote and dedicate my life to helping artists show their work? And, um, well, I haven't found the ultimate answer, but I hope I will and I'll be able to to do more for artists and I will be more successful in the future. So uh, I think that's something that's really a passion more than a job again. And I, I hope that um, one day artists will appreciate that not all gallerists are out there to, uh, to make money off their back, but also to help and, 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 and to be a part of what they're creating. Philippe? Thank you, Eric Morlot, for sharing your story. This is Sounds Like Portraits, a podcast by Philippe Ungar. Music, Charmeuse de Serpent, composed and conducted by Olivier Glisson. See you soon for the next episode.